Aleluya. Can you move that uh, whiteboard back over this way, if you wouldn't mind? Aleluya. I like it a lot. I watch movies too. <laughs> but my movies I always want to make them smart and smarter. You got to be pretty smart to come up with stuff like that, you know. Okay, you know. I think so. Well, it's been a good time. Did everybody have a good lunch? You know, I promised to get you out of here before midnight. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul preached till midnight. He, the, his results was one died on him. That's good preaching. I put many to sleep, but they never have died on me yet. You know, and uh, the guy, what did he do? He fell out of the window, didn't he? And he died. You know. So what Paul do? He went down and said, "You ain't dying in my service." Yeah. yeah. Calling a church the other day, man. Old man had a heart attack and died. Emergency people got there. They carried out four people before they figured out they had the wrong people. Oh. <laughs> they finally got to him, though. But I tell people, I've never raised anybody from the dead. So if you die in this service, you got a 50-50 chance. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> you know? I think so. I'm waiting for my first one to show up one of these days. I'm going to raise somebody from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, it's a nightmare. I want to, uh, I want to go back to this. Uh, I, I just want to give you a, dis, uh, a notice right now. I will not get through your blanks. Um, but uh, I feel like God is downloading some things to us. Because if we understand the beginning, we're going to understand the end. If, if uh, what's it Lord Acton said, if you, don't learn, if you don't know your past, you'll not have a future. And one of the things that the enemy is trying to do is do, to destroy our past because he knows then he can destroy the future. Uh, when, many years ago, I went into the country of Romania. We were talking about that last night, Brother Dean. And uh, it was under the dictator Ceausescu. And some of you may remember him. He met his Waterloo at the end of a bullet. And, um, and his wife, I guess they were in agreement. I don't know. And... Um, but while I was there uh, at that particular time, uh, I was talking to some of the leaders one day and they said, you know, Romania, their history started in 1945. And they said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, everything before 1945 is myths and fables. The communists took over in 1945. And everything before that was myths and fables. And from that point on is their history. And the communists understood that if I can destroy their history, I can control their future. See? And so we now, I was telling lunch today, the spirits that we've dealt with over in Eastern Europe and Africa and the Middle East and Russia and places like that, We've seen those spirits, but those spirits are now out of the Eastern Hemisphere, and those spirits are now in the Western Hemisphere. Would you agree with that, yeah. Brother Dean? They are in the Western Hemisphere. So what do we see happening in our nation? Let's tear down the statues. They can come up with all kinds of reasons, but there's one reason those statues are up there. It's history. Good, bad, or indifferent. It is a, it's history, and it deals with our future. See, and so when I start explaining this to the young people, they just kind of look at you, you know. And I said, because you don't understand that, we're in a, we're in a lot of serious trouble and things. And so, so we're learning some things as we go along and, and advancing here. And so some of the things that we're looking at today, why I came back to this original intent, because if you don't understand God's original purpose, there's no need for a missions conference. Because all we'll do is go tell people about Jesus and not transform the nations. Right. Oh, yeah. And God's objective isn't just to get somebody saved. His goal is to transform the nation. Yes. It's yes. to make earth look like heaven. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. You know? And so uh, we have done a good job at telling people about Jesus. And we need to do that. And we've done a great job at that. What we've not done a good job at is transforming the nation. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. 
And you go back into early history and, and up until really the 1830s, there was a document came out that basically detached the church from the cultures of the world. There's about 10 things that they did. I don't have time to go into them. There's about 10 things that they made a decision that's still affecting the church today. That it's them out there and us in here. See? And so it's, it's caused us to everybody becomes then a project instead of a, a person that has a divine purpose in the culture. See? And so what we do is, and, and like I said earlier, that we, we need to go and have evangelism. But I want to tell you, that's minute compared to what God wants to do. I don't know if you read the last chapter of the book of Revelation, but we're in charge. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we don't, we're not waiting to get to the Revelation 22 before we take, take charge. I'm not saying take over, take charge. The Bible says that we're to rule now. Yeah. And that's what I want to talk to you about this afternoon. I want you to go to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to do a little artwork here. <laughs> Maybe. All right. A little artwork this afternoon. And I want you to go to Romans chapter 12. And uh, we're going to look at this because it deals with the aspect of the fall. And um, I, I want to thank you for the little celebration for our brother Aiden. Aiden, he's going to make it. He's a mighty man of faith and power. I prophesy that over him. In fact, he's my replacement. All right. Hallelujah. We're going to start calling him apostle, whether he is or not. All right. Okay. You know, and uh, but uh, I want you to think about this idea of vision. All right. And I want you to and I'm not going to stay here long on it, but I want you to shift just a little bit because I've, I talked to so many pastors and leaders that were under such pressure to define and come up with a vision. And most pastors cannot. No, they'll tell you, we want to reach the city, we want to tell you this thing. But if you really got down to specifics of it, they have no clue. Other than stand up and preach on Sunday and go visit them in the hospital and, you know, go down to the jail and all that kind of stuff. And so I wrestle with that with the Lord because most of our vision teaching in the modern day came out of Korea from Dr. Paul Young Cho. And his was get a vision, you know, he talked about all that kind of stuff. And very important, vision is part of that. But I'm convinced what God does to the set person or the head person in a ministry or leadership, what he does with them is he deposits the mission. All right? The mission. Okay, now we can develop this some more, but I wanted to cede this to you today because some of you are trying to get this vision and the vision is only going to mature to the level of the one who has the vision. Yeah, come on. But the mission is established by God that you're at point A and I want you to go to point B and this is your part and I'm going to use Joshua the next part and I'm going to use them the next part on and down and down. The mission doesn't change what the personnel does. Visions for you die with you. So what I'm encouraging pastors to go back and examine this and look at this idea, Moses' mission was not to get the children of Israel into the promised land. His mission was to get them out of Egypt to the border. That was his mission. That's why he wandered around 40 years with them, because his mission wasn't done. I mean, you know, you've got to get rid of some people sometimes in order to get the next generation ready. How many of you like to lay hands on people in your church? Am I the only one? I mean, that's a good ministry. You know, to me, I think the best ministry is, is get them saved, shoot them right there, and they go on to heaven. You go to hell, but they'll go on to heaven. You get more in heaven, and they will, then you go to hell. All right, but anyway. All right. Now, look at this. Joshua's mission was to get them across the border and settle them in the land. Okay. Are you with me? Now, let me watch this. Come here, Pastor. All right. So he has mission. So we're here now, rocking along, and we are here, we're at point A, and we gotta move, I gotta move all of you down here 
to point B. This is the mission. So in that process, come back over here. Okay. What are you doing down there? Oh. Okay, all right. In this process, he starts walking towards the mission. I come along as a part of the community. God gives me a vision for children. I come now get the strategy of that. That's where the power is. I come and I submit it under the eldership of the house. They pray about it, confirm it, take me for the body and the community and lay hands on me to release it. Now what happens is my vision is pushing the mission. Marquita comes along. She says, hey, I have this vision for women. Mm. She has a strategy laid out. Now listen, it may be a month, it may be five years, it may be perpetual. That's, that's part of the strategy. You've got to know when the beginning and the end. They, uh, Nehemiah, the king said, how long is it going to take you? See, he had to come up with a time. We don't. We think once we get something going, it's forever. And so what we wind up doing is feeding these fatted calves and moving along. So Marquita has this vision here now. She comes, submits it, they're in agreement with the mission. What happens? She's pushing the mission. Somebody else comes along, youth, pushing the mission. Then somebody comes in, there's one in every church. She has a mission for rescuing dogs and cats. <laughs> and man, she's sold on it. You know, she got everything laid out and all the dog food and everything. And how many of you know, anybody has a vision from cats, I know, is part of the Antichrist system, in my opinion. Huh? <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a red flag for me right there, I'm telling you, you know. <laughs> cats, they're sneaky. They're like the devil. That's why I don't want them around my house. Yeah. So she comes, she lays it out, she gives it to the leaders and says, ah, I got this vision. They pray about it. It's not part of the mission. It's her personal vision. You can pray for it, but you don't have to. You can support it, but you don't have to. Why? Because it's not under the authorization of the mission. You can encourage her, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's wonderful. You can do all that. But it doesn't push the mission. Are you with me? See, his goal is this is A to B. When I get to B, what is B to C? And, and it may not be him. It may be somebody else. See, what is C to D? So remember David? David said, man, I'm going to build God a house. Yeah. Prophet comes along and says, that's a great idea. Man, he no longer got, sooner got out of the bathroom, man. And he was going, hey, go back and tell him that's not his job. Yeah. That's not his mission. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. All right, so now, thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Give Pastor a good hand. He did a good job. You ought to marry him. Okay, all right. Now look. Why? Because there's two things I want you to get. Mission transforms. Vision does not. Mission transforms. Vision not. Vision is done through power and mission is done through authority. And there's a difference. And that's what I'm going to Why? Because several, I think I shared this in Elgin when we first met. I went through about a five year, in, in, let me back up. In Abraham's life, there were seven, some believe there were nine plateaus in his life. And each one of those required another step into another dimension with God in Abraham's life. And so in our life, we have the same thing. We think, you know, what we're doing right now, we're going to do it forever. And that's the attitude you should have. But it won't be what you do all your life. Some of you start out teaching Sunday school, and now they need teachers, and they're looking at you, and you're going, I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. You know. But the reality is, is that time is over for you. So you've already graduated beyond that plateau. That doesn't mean you can't do it, you know, as a service and all that kind of stuff, but it's not really what God wants you to do at this stage in your life. 
And if we would mature ourselves and grow up and start being moved and led by the Spirit instead of the need of the moment, we would be much more energized and, and fulfilled. And maybe God's saying, shut it down for a season. Does that make sense? All right, so here we are now. So I would, I'm going through this period of time in my life, you know. How many of you know if you're miserable, you want company? <laughs> Am I the only one? You know, so I was, I was having this time with God. And in the morning times, I usually get up in the morning and I get in my chair and have my coffee and the word and all that. And, and I'm talking to the Lord about this. And, and, and so the word that, that we hear all the time is, God, I, I don't like this transition. Has anybody here just ever done somersaults over transition? You know? And I'm, I'm crying out to God. God, I, you know, I don't like this transition. And so the Lord speaks to me one morning and says, Terry, I don't take people through transition. He said, I take them through transformation. Transition is your way of changing for God. And usually it's wrong. Transformation is him changing you for what he wants to form you to be at that stage in your life. That's why you can look at the same scriptures. Preachers, you've done this. How many have ever gone, how many pastors in here have ever gone back to old notes and say, I can preach this this weekend? Now, how many know you may have the outline, but you ain't got the same material that you preached it the first time? Is that right? Yeah, we all have experienced that. Why? Because you have changed. You've been transformed. And transformation is a lifelong process. See? So Romans 12, Paul's talking to him here. And I want to get into this just a little bit. Because he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your soma, your bodies, that's the totality of your person, your spirit, your soul, and your body, a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Or the New American Standard, I think, says your reasonable act of worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. All right, so transformation. What is transformation? Transformation is the process of growing up. It's a process. How many of you know, how many of you, how many of you read the book of Hebrews? And how many of you know, in chapter 5, it's the most frustrating book in all of the Bible. Why? Because the writer of Hebrews is explaining what we are, the order of Melchizedek. Yet we demonstrate the, the order of Levitic, the, the Levitical priesthood. But we live under the order of the Melchizedek priesthood. So what happens is he's, he's teaching along, and we've all done this. John, you've seen this. You're teaching along, and all of a sudden people are looking at you, but they ain't listening. You got their eyes. You ain't got their ears and nothing else is paying attention. Why? Because it says, he said, whoa, 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 back up, back up. He said, I have much more to say to you. The most devastating words in the Bible to me. He said, but you have become dull of hearing. Dull of hearing. What something that will transform you and absolutely change your life, you can't comprehend it because I've reached the saturation point on you. See, I'm doing that with some of you right now. See, all those carbs and stuff that you had for lunch, you know. <laughs> See, I told you to lay off those sugars, you know. I think so. But nobody goes to sleep in any of my meetings. If you do, you stand up here by me. <laughs> and I'm 6'7". So we'll get you up here one way or another, all right? Okay, now look at this. He says in that passage that you're dull of hearing, so I can't share with you. He said, because I want you to go on to maturity, or perfection is the word. Maturity. So if we're going to be a son of God, and we use the word son because in the kingdom, there's neither male or female. It's not a gender issue. It's just a concept issue. 
And so it's called sons. Female, male, you're called a son in the kingdom. There's neither male nor female in the kingdom. And so if God is designed, Ephesians chapter four, uh, 1, verse 4 and 5, his design is to raise up sons that are holy and blameless and in love with him or in love, then we've got to understand that he's called us to be sons. Now, let's look at this, all right? I want to draw something up here. Once again, I'm not a good artist. Are you an artist? I I, I, I hate that voice of doubt right there, okay, all right? But uh, let's start this out here, okay? Because I want you to see if we're going to, to change here, all right? That's a Texas hill right there. And with Romans, uh, with Romans 12, he's talking about being not conformed. We've heard enough preaching on that, that we could preach it better than anybody else. Uh, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind, and we understand that dynamic that's there, the, the whole metamorphosis of taking place there. But what, we got, what happened with Adam in the garden, when, when, when the serpent came to Eve, he came and he caused her to sin. Why is that so important? Sin is taking by force what God has given you by grace. I want, you, I want you to soak that in, all right? Anything that despairs the grace of God is sin. All right? So what the serpent came to the woman, he found the entrance, he deceives the woman by offering her something that he could never have, but, uh, but offering her something that he didn't have, and by her giving him something that she had. And what he offered her was divine authority, because he said, you will be like God. Because he wanted her delegated authority that God had given her. See? And so what happens then, and notice, I think it's very interesting with, when the serpent does this, you don't hear of him again until the New Testament. Basically. Yeah, there's a few places in there. But all of a sudden now, Jesus now is starting to deal with this demonic thing. Why? Because he was not, Jesus never recognized the devil as a delegated authority. He always recognized him as a usurper of authority. And the day we grasp a hold of that, we'll stop giving the devil all the things that he has because we treat him as delegated authority by calling him the God of this world. And he is not the God of this world. If he is, then Jesus went to the cross for no purpose. He came and destroyed that. He put it to rest. He ended it. He put it a con conclusion of it. And the only power that the devil has is what we allow him to do. See? But we become masters at demonology and very minute when it comes to Christology. And so what do we have to do? We have to keep reminding people of your authority. We have to keep reminding people you can do this. We have to keep reminding people instead of being like Adam. It says that in, in uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, he says he has called us what? To reign in life. Yeah. Reign in life. We have no idea what that means because we don't understand a monarchical system. The way we think of reigning is you've got to be voted in. <laughs> and then you don't know for six weeks. God help us. Thank God the forefathers of the Constitution said it's got to be decided by the 23rd of November. So Thanksgiving, we'll have peace. We may not have agreement, but we'll have peace. All right, okay. Now look at here. Why? Because here's what you understand. Here's the process that we see. It says in 1 John chapter 2, it describes three phases. It, it describes a child, it describes a youth, and it describes a father. Three levels that's here. So we have a, a child, we have a youth, and we have a father. Okay, everybody read that? Can you read that? Okay, all right. Now look at this. When Adam fell in the garden, he lost his authority, but he didn't lose his power. He still have, mankind still had power. That's why you see a lot of the King Davids and the Abrahams and the Moses and things. They didn't necessarily operate from 
authority, but they operated from power. All right? But here's what you understand. The devil operates from power. Okay? So under this child here, we're going to put this word power. Okay? Or the Greek word is what? Dunamis. But what Adam had and he lost was authority. Okay? Am I getting cold in here or my nose is just running? Now, when we start this journey of being transformed, we're at a child, but when we come and we accept Jesus, the Bible says we're a novice. Doesn't that say that in 1 Timothy? You know, you're not to turn a novice loose, you know? Um, how many of you know we've seen enough novices make the, the mistakes that they make? But here's what you understand. Galatians chapter three, into chapter 3 and chapter 4, this novice says, legally, legally, this person is a son now. They've come to Jesus. Okay? Thank you, ma'am. Come to Jesus. So they're a son. So how many know the day you got saved, you became a son? This means yes in Texas. This means no. And in India, I don't know what that means. They just kind of, I don't know if that's where they got their original bobbleheads. I don't know, you know. But I love it. I, I was in India one time and I was teaching some stuff and I was asking some things and they'd come up and they'd go. I go, was that a yes or a no? I don't know. Maybe that's I don't know, you know. And, things. and so what happens is, is that this novice area, I'm, we're talking about transformation now. This is the area that we initiate. This is initiating right here. This starts the journey. How many remember the day you got saved? Day three of you. All right. How many of you remember the day you got saved? Oh, now we got six. Okay, all right. Okay, well, if you need help, talk to your mother. As far as I know, you've always been saved, even in the womb, you know. But under power, power... Our rallying cry has been Mark chapter 16. What does it say? Go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. Is that what it says? What does it say? Lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. You know, cast out demons. They shall speak in new tongues. Yada, yada, yada. Things like that. But all of that applies to the individual. Okay. What do we see today? This is where most of our church world is today. We're trying to figure out how to get power when we already have it. Why are we seeing the healings? Where's the power of God? It's not with God. He already gave it to us. Now what happens here? In Mark chapter 16, here's what you've got to understand. When you came to Christ, what it did, first of all, it relieved, it relieved your conscience. How many remember the day you got saved, all of a sudden your language changed, your world began to change, you didn't want to hang around those deadbeats, you know, you told your ungodly boyfriend or girlfriend to hit the road. How many remember that? Why? Because something had happened deep down in your conscience area that brought to life God in your life that was greater than anything else that was around you. All right? Now, we're starting this journey. Why? Because we're here under power. And this is where most of the church wants to remain, under power. Now, let me, let me point this out, okay? Because under power... There's an initiation that takes place. So what do we do under power? We have evangelistic campaigns to demonstrate the power of God. Uh, India has a lot of those, don't they? Has a, has a lot of that. You go, some of you, I'm sure, David, you guys have experienced that, about the power of God, okay? It's part of the kingdom, all right? And so we also have pastoral things under power. Uh, we, we ascribe to the one that's the shepherd, Man, he's got power over us, see? And so 
uh, it's part of this beginning as an individual. I need this person in my life. All right. We also, uh, we also have the teaching ministry that's there. Okay. Uh, true teaching is done through, uh, through the power of God. You know, through the power of God. We put this all down here. But notice the audience. Who are we teaching? Who are we pastoring? Who are we uh, evangelizing? Because we hear it over and over again. And we keep trying to get more power so we can do those things again and again and again to the same people that are not matured. And so if I hear anything from spiritual leadership is, my God, when are they going to grow up? See, the best government is self-government. And if we can't master self-government here on earth, when you step over into glory and you haven't mastered self-government, guess what? You're put in the school of God again. Because in the beginning, it was self-government. In the end, it will be self-government. Self-government under God will be the rule in the heavenly realm. And what happens is, is that when man could no longer have self-government, Noah comes along, and what does God institute? Civil government. And it's been a mess ever since then. Amen. See, God warned the children of Israel. He said, listen, I want to be your king. They go, no, no, we want to be like the other nations. You go into some churches, they go, well, you know, uh, Gateway's doing this. If we can just do it like Gateway, we can just do it like that. It tells you how immature the church really is, is that we got to copy a model down here instead of coming up with our own prototype that becomes the model for somebody else to copy. Are y'all all right? Now look at here. This power, it touches the mind. Touches the mind. And so our mind is being changed because of power. Oh, you know what I saw the other day? Oh, do you know what I saw? You know what the Lord showed me? And it's touched, this power thing is touching the mind. But notice, it doesn't take you out of this arena. Pastor can get up and he can, and the big thing right now is series. Well, I'm starting a series. I'm starting a series. Whatever just happened to fall in the Holy Ghost for a while. Amen. Yeah. Now, I understand we need series, and I understand all that type of stuff. But what they're saying is, i got to touch the mind because you're not mature enough to figure it out on your own. Uh, you're not being transformed, you're just being transitioned, and you're transitioned to my maturity level, says the leader. So if he doesn't grow or she doesn't grow, guess what? You're only going to go to that level. All right, is everybody all right? Yeah. I'm talking to leaders now, all right? Okay. Hang with me, all right? It gets better, honestly. You know, because y'all look like you're ready to stone me. I asked pastor if you got rid of all those. We're going to take a stone offering, you know? I think so. Why? Because power gives us the benefits of God. And this is what we're after. Oh, heal me, deliver me, you know, prosper me. You know, save my kids, all that kind of stuff. We'll just do all the right things. That's what a child thinks like. If I please daddy, everything's going to be all right. You know, everything's going to be good. And I get all this down here. I get the candy. Well, come on, brother. It's good. See? So the child is here. Now we start moving over to this level here. Okay? The youth. Now I want to say this to you. 90% of our pastors and leaders today in the body of Christ are at an adolescent spiritual age. I wish that I had brought uh, with me, I've got a book, it's called Eight Stages of Spiritual Growth. And I used to have pastors come, or people come up to me and say, how do you gauge your spiritual age? And I go, well, you just know. <laughs> when you don't know, you fake it. Don't sit there and look so innocent, I'm telling you. <laughs> Yeah. And then pastors come up to me and say, how do you gauge the spiritual age of your church? I go, well, you're the pastor. You should know. 
So one day I'm in prayer and the Lord speaks to me. He said, why don't you give me an answer? And I said, I would if I had one. <laughs> and the Lord took me on a study of eight Greek words in the, in the New Testament from toddler all the way up to an adult. And I, I put together a whole seminar and did a book on it. It's entitled, How Old Are You? And most leaders, why? Let's describe a young person. What's their makeup? How about the young people? Hmm? It's not a trick question. I really want to open up the conversation here. All right? Okay. What's a, what's a young person like? What, what's, their, what's their makeup? They're brash. Brash. Okay. Sandy, do you have something or are you just chowing on the, on the goodies? Chowing. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Focus. What? Focus. No focus. Ooh. Or self focus. Yeah, there you go. What? Hurried, or trying to move everything. Hurried. Oh, man, yeah. Social. Yeah. Social. There you go. Mobile. How about popularity? Yeah. You know? Yeah. How about Starbucks? <laughs> huh? Isn't that part of their vocabulary nowadays? Yeah. You know, father, son, and holy Starbucks. You know, that type of thing, you know? <laughs> and so, you know they said they're getting one here. I'm telling you guys, you're in for trouble. You're going to lose all your young people. I'm telling you, they're right out the door. I'm just kidding. All right. There you go. Borrowing money. Yeah. Yeah. How about dependency upon somebody else? How about manipulation? What's some other things that describe that? Because what I'm describing to you is most spiritual leadership in the body of Christ right now. What you're describing. And they will not move off of that. God's told me to build this. I got to build this. I got to do this. I got to raise the money. It's amazing how we start out in a small living room and all of a sudden this monstrosity grows and we feel like we own it all. Let me say this to pastors. Don't ask for any more volunteers because it's not in the Bible. Volunteers is me meeting my own need through somebody else. The Bible teaches stewardship. You go and pray, and if God tells you to do it, see, the, the Holy Ghost can keep you, <laughs> he can keep you awake for hours while I'm sleeping in bed while God's talking to you about being a steward of working in the toddlers. I remember one time our toddler worker came to me and she said, man, we need some people to work in the, the nursery. And I said, okay, I'll take care of it. So I stood up on Sunday morning. I said, okay. I said, how many of you believe you're going to heaven? Of course, you know, they all raise their hand. Most of them are truthful. Uh, I had some, still had some questions about, you know, things. But uh, so all of a sudden now, I said, if you believe you're going to heaven, when you get to heaven, God's going to look down your chart and he's going to say, usher, uh, youth worker, oh, you, went to, you worked in the camps, but he doesn't see toddler or nursery there. I said, do you want to spend a thousand years changing poopy diapers? I said, we need some help in the nursery. Get it taken care of right now. Man, we had all kinds of volunteers. <laughs> uh, see, that wasn't a lie. That's called an allegory. <laughs> all right. You got back to go, what's an allegory? Is it akin to a gator? <laughs> okay. Now, why do we say this? Why? Because the youth, this area here, is, is the domain of administrators. If I hear anything about spiritual leadership, if they spend as much time in prayer and study of the word like the early church did, they would get far more results. But most of it's done spending time in being busy with administration. Now we need administration, but there's a gift in the body of Christ called an administrator. You know, and we need to pray they come in, see? See, I, I am of the opinion that you administrate your gift. As an apostle, I administrate that gift. If you're an apostle, you administrate that gift. If you're a prophet, you administrate that gift. You know, you will be in administration. There's no getting around it. All right. 
And I've had it all. I've had the secretaries and I've had this and I've had that. I've had it all. The happiest day of my life was when I walked out of the church and I had a legal pad and a pencil. I didn't even have a pen. I was free. And I've been that way ever since. You know. But administrators hang out here. Another thing happens here is there's another gift in the Bible that uh, is found in uh, Corinthians and it's called languages. How many of you know preachers can change the whole culture of the community by adopting their own language of the culture into the community? I was in the Northwest. You've got to understand, people in the Northwest, they all came from California. So there's flakes and nuts all up and down the West Coast. <laughs> and uh, so one Sunday morning, I'd been relating to this young man. Uh, he told me he wanted me to be his father, and I had questions about that. Um, and so one morning I was at his church, and so we got up and ready for communion, and I looked down at the communion table, and he had donuts and milk. And I'm thinking, man, we're in fellowship right here in the church. You know, donuts is God's will. How many know that? <laughs> How many know donuts are going to be served at the marriage supper of the Lamb? If you don't believe that, you need to get saved right now. Come right here this moment, all right? Okay. But he serves milk and donuts for communion. Well, now I had to wrestle with my, is this religious or is this, is this acceptable? I'm wrestling with the Holy Ghost here. But Jesus didn't say, take this cup of milk. He didn't say, break this donut as much as I wanted to, you know. <laughs> And so, so afterwards at the church service here, he wanted to be accepted in the community. So he comes up with all this stuff. Instead of being unique, he wanted to be accepted. So he does stuff, just kind of be unorthodox like everybody else. And he brings us. So at lunchtime, we're sitting there. And I know this happened, you know. So he says to me, he goes, well, what do you think? It's about what? He's about the milk and the donuts. God showed me that. Mm -hmm. I go, well, me and you asked. He gave me permission. And I said, that was the most demonic thing you did tonight. You almost got close to blasphemy. What? He doesn't say. I said, yeah, oh, yeah, it does say. Several places right there. Well, that was the culture. No, that's the body and that's the blood. That's the principle. It, ha it has nothing to do with the milk. It has, he said, take the wine. He said, take the bread. There's all kinds of symbolism, but it's not symbolism. It's actually a, where the Spirit of Christ actually dwells at the communion table, and you're throwing things in his face. Yeah. The guy starts weeping. He couldn't even eat his steak. So I said to him, are you going to finish that? No, I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. But what happens is, is it, what has happened in our churches today, now we've changed the language. We've adapted and made things. See, we don't have discipling anymore. We have mentoring. Good term. I love it. I use it. See? But if I don't understand the backdrop of, of, of when I use the word mentoring, it really means discipling, then I have missed it. But mentoring sometimes means, well, I can take it or leave it. Discipling means discipline. And that's a dirty word in our culture. See? And so what happens is, is that the administrators now take over. They now administrate all this back here. See, they're making sure that the child is taken care of, making sure that he's getting burped. Making sure his diapers are being changed. Making sure he gets his little toddler outfits. Making sure that he's cute in the little pictures. You get the picture of what I'm trying to say to you. In other words, we have kept them in immaturity because we have only have a concept of power. Now, write this down. Here's the progress. Because what happens is eventually these places die out. Or they lose their, their, at least their influence. And that's all they have is influence. Okay? They don't have authority. Now look at this. What starts out with the anointing, it costs you something to maintain that anointing. See, once anointed doesn't mean you're always right. King Saul 
very clearly gives us that picture. And so it takes something to maintain that posture of anointing. And it's costly. I'm telling you, when everybody else is going out and having fun, you got to be doing some things, maybe getting ready for a meeting or getting ready for this or getting ready to, to, to minister to somebody or whatever. There's somehow, there's a price to pay to maintain that anointing. And what happens is, is that in youth, they don't want to do that. Let's move on to the next thing. So what happens? When we no longer pay the price for the anointing, guess what we do? We replace it with education. Education. Well, let's just get them smarter. Let's just do these training programs. And I, and I believe in all that. I've got doctor's degrees and everything. There's nothing wrong with that. But education can never take the place of the anointing. Yeah. And so what do we do? We, we, we get in these programs. We have our schools come in and things like that. Listen, you know, uh, uh, and so we, we get into the education part of it. And what, what does education do without the anointing? It produces knowledge, not wisdom, knowledge. What happens to knowledge? It puffs up. And next thing you know, you got everybody sitting in front of you. And man, they're nothing but one big pride bubble in front of you. And you're there preaching along and they're nodding their head because they already know it. They already know it. They already know it. Nodding their head. Yeah. They're nodding their head. That's right. That's right. See. And so what happens when education doesn't work anymore? Got to keep the kids busy. Got to keep them out of trouble. So what do we do? We go to social programs. Let's feed the poor. Let's help the homeless. And the world starts looking then at our ministry as a poor man's ministry. They don't want anything to do with it. I was with a guy from Belarus. And he was telling me that uh, he'd worked with a pastor down in that area. And... Uh, uh, in a poor part of town and this guy had a building down there and he says he gave me the building so I could start a church and he said what do you think I go well that's good I said but you're not going to build a church for poor people he said what I said yeah that building it should be your mission but you need to find those places and those that are ready to be mentored and discipled and I said, they've already proven themselves in their lifestyle. Those guys that Jesus selected, they weren't from the poor part of town. But they were the ones who carried on the mission to the poor people. Feeding 5,000, sit down. Now you distribute it to them. Say, you got to be selective. If you're going to build a church, you can't build it on those that have no foundation and no, no leaning in their own life. The, the poor, and once again, I'm not saying we don't minister to the poor, but we think we can build that. In fact, in India, they say Christianity is a poor man's religion. Isn't that right? That's the way they say it in India. See? And so what we want to target is we want to target those that have influence. Those that have a voice. Those that are there. Those that we can mentor and develop into this. I was listening to Katrina's uh, uh, testimony. See, those are the kind. See, she's, what she's done in her life and how she's prepared herself. Now we can take that and transform that into a kingdom tool that God can use. When we get into social program, you know, get our food banks down here. Once again, there's nothing wrong with those at the direction of God and under the anointing. We have those ministries. But then when social programs no longer work, it's whatever. And when you get to whatever, now you're opening the door for demons in the midst of the community. Classic example, Jesus goes in the synagogue. Oh, thou son of God. He says, shut up. See, they were, had reached that point. Why? Because we just want to keep the child entertained. Are y'all all right? Yeah. All right, fix. Take a break here, okay? But let me get let me get this to you, okay? Because I want you to understand this. Well, let me just oh, we'll take a break from here, but um, but it has to start somewhere. From initiation, then what happens here is in this area 
is we have to maintain the ministry through impression. How many people did you get saved? How many people got delivered? Who cares? Who cares? But we have to justify what we do. We have to justify our resources. And I understand good stewardship. I understand all that type of stuff. But people who are impressed don't stay long. Because you've got to keep impressing them. I remember what Dick Iverson said to us one time. He said, you know, he said, we were called the Revival Temple. And he said, he said, as long as we were pulling the rabbit out of the hat, everybody was coming. He said, until the guy down the street started pulling the hat out of the rabbit and everybody started going there. <laughs> now you get the picture. See, your, your ministry that you've got is not a ministry of impression. Come on. Come on. It's not a ministry of impression. If they're impressed, so be it. But man, I'm telling you, we design our buildings for people that don't want to come there. See, I walked around the building yesterday. That thing has got far beyond. And I, when I get to the second part of this, I believe that's what this building is designed for. When I get to the other part of this. But man, just to have a facility sitting out there so you can impress the community, I'm telling you, I would not want that responsibility. I went into that tunnel, that train tunnel yesterday. And way back there was a little old spot about that big. It was a window and a door. I asked the pastor, is that a train coming down through there, you know? Uh, <laughs> Because it's so huge. And so we've got to, I want us to raise our hands right now. We've spent way too much time with kids. And building our ministry around being children babysitters. And it's done nothing but wear us out. And it's high time that we start saying, grow up. And start taking them to that place where they will be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, transformed today. And I release you now in the name of Jesus. That you'll get those novices, but, and you'll get those children, but you won't be satisfied that they're there. Because how they will come to you is not because you've impressed them, even though that may be part of it, but there's something more dynamic that's in you. And we're going to find that out today. In the name of Jesus, I release you from the pressure. This is a pressure thing. I release you from the pressure of this style of ministry where you have to be all powerful, you know, all the time. I release you from it and get back to God's original intent. And that was to be a person of authority. Authority. In the name of Jesus. And I thank you for it now. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Is this all right? Okay, all right, we're going to take a break. They're already putting signs up for me back there. I got it, sweetheart. I appreciate that. All right. Okay, we're going to take a...